Good morning. Good morning. All right, everyone's here. I was a reporter, not at the New York Times, but at the Financial Times, the international business newspaper, staffed almost exclusively by people who went to either Cambridge or Oxford. And I had had a good run. I was the odd American man there, but I would gotten to write stories about Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook. I scored an exclusive jailhouse interview with Bernie Madoff. But I needed my next story. I didn't know what it was going to be. It had to be a good one. It was looking for something that would be of real personal interest to me. And so I was sitting at my desk one day when I read a brief wire story about General Mills, a food company in Minnesota. And it said that at General Mills, people were practicing meditation on the job. And when I read this, the hair on the back of my neck stood up because I didn't go to Cambridge or Oxford. I spent the better part of the last half of my college experience here in India. This is Bodh Gaya in northern India. It's the place where the Buddha ostensibly achieved enlightenment some 2,600 years ago. And I went there and I studied Buddhism for my philosophy studies. I sat under the Bodhi tree deep in silence. I studied from this man, Anagarika Manindraji, one of the great mindfulness teachers of the 20th century, and he would speak to me about moment-to-moment -moment awareness, being right here, right now, not getting lost in thoughts about the future, not dwelling with our preoccupations about the past, but just doing whatever it is you're doing fully. If you're making a cup of tea, just make a cup of tea. If you're walking, just walk. And if you're working, just work. Give your full self to it without getting lost in distracted thought. I spent amazing times in India. I took the bodhisattva vows under the Bodhi tree, and I even considered staying there. There was a moment where I thought my vocation in life would actually be to take robes. And had I, my parents were a little nervous because they're like, you are going to end up like Yogi Mike. And uh, that wasn't my path. Instead, I came back. Uh, I'm now a reporter at the New York Times, and I still go on retreat. I describe myself as a sporadic meditator. I find times to slip into deep periods of silence at places like Spirit Rock and here at Kripalu. But for the most part, my temple has been the newsroom, the newsroom of the New York Times, full of tight deadlines, screaming editors, and these two parts of my life have been very separate. There's my personal life as a practitioner and my work life as a business reporter. And there was very little dialogue until a few years ago. And then I read that story about General Mills. And I thought, what on earth do the people that make Hamburger Helper, haagen ice cream, and all these sugary cereals have to tell me about mindfulness? So I had to go check it out. I was skeptical. I got on a plane. I went out to Minnetonka, Minnesota, to the corporate headquarters. And I was wondering, what on earth am I going to find here? Is it anything I'm going to recognize? Are they actually going to be meditating? I don't know. But I show up at 3 o'clock on a Tuesday, big room about this size, off the main lobby of the corporate campus, and I walk in, and this is what I find. Dozens of people in silence. It looked like they were meditating, but I didn't really know. And then I heard the woman who had organized this group start speaking. Janice Martirano, and she started using phrases like being right here, right now, non-judgmental awareness, whatever it is you're doing, just do that, not getting lost in thoughts of the future or ruminations about the past. And of course, I recognized those words because they were the same words I had heard under the Bodhi tree in India. And I would later learn that, in fact, the lineage was unbroken. Janice had studied with teachers who had studied with my teachers from India, and yet something fundamental had changed. Across thousands of years and thousands of miles, Buddhism had become available as a purely secular offering. They were not teaching Buddhism at General Mills, and none of the other companies I would subsequently discover are teaching Buddhism either. Instead, they found a kernel of universal truth that being right here, right now, has inherent value and they've worked to bring that out. So today, there is a meditation room in every building on General Mills' corporate campus, and hundreds of employees have participated in this program. 
I wrote a story about it, The Mind Business, for the Financial Times, Weekend Magazine, and it went viral. I mean, more so than Mark Zuckerberg, more so than Bernie Madoff. People wanted to know where they could find out more. Who else was doing that? How could they, too, bring mindfulness and meditation to their own offices? And I had none of the answers to that. But I set off in hopes of learning them. I went on a journey into the contemplative heart of corporate America. And what I found is that at Goldman Sachs, people are meditating on the job. They're training their investment bankers to become more focused, less stressed, maybe even a bit more compassionate. We'll see. At Facebook, they're having whole compassion research days, training their engineers how to write code that allows its one billion users to have more peaceable interactions with one another. I went to Davos for the New York Times to cover the World Economic Forum, and I expected every morning to start with a, an hour of high-powered networking. Instead, every morning started with an hour of silent meditation. Amid the chattering of the global elite, I wrote, a silent interlude. And it was the only time these people ever stopped talking. And of course, it's not just the business world. These companies and more have found ways to bring mindfulness and meditation into the workplace. But in schools, they're finding that children become better learners and teachers more resilient on the job by bringing mindfulness and meditation to their practice. The military is using mindfulness and meditation not to make more effective snipers, but to make more resilient people when they come home. And even in prisons, some of the toughest characters in this country are finding that mindfulness and meditation can make one of the most unimaginable situations a little less stressful. So let's practice. If I may, I would invite everyone to find a position that's upright, comfortable, if you're comfortable with it, close your eyes and just take a few deep breaths. And notice what it feels like to breathe. Just find the sensation of your breath wherever you feel it strongest. It might be the air passing in and out of your nostrils. It might be your diaphragm rising and falling. Just actually notice what that feels like. And now you may be lost in thought already. That's perfectly fine. Just notice that, thinking, and bring your attention back to the breath. When you're ready, open your eyes. No one's ready. Everyone's eyes are still closed. They're like, stay there. That's the briefest taste of the actual practice of mindfulness meditation. And when you actually think about what we just did, we actually stopped for a moment. We got... We broke that velocity of the day, took a moment just to be right here, right now. How rare is that? I mean, whether it is how we are at home, let alone at work, it's so rare to actually pause. And yet, companies around the country are making space for this. Why? One reason is that mindfulness has been shown to be a powerful antidote to stress. And we're all stressed. Maybe not the brothers in the front row and sisters, but indeed most of us with our day jobs are truly stressed. I don't care if you're the CEO, a line worker, or a middle manager. Work is difficult. There's a reason they call it work. The World Health Organization estimates that stress costs businesses $300 billion per year in lost productivity. So imagine, just imagine what would happen if people were a little less stressed on the job. Well, lots of companies have been exploring that path. Green Mountain Coffee Roasters up in Waterbury, Vermont. The CEO was a meditator himself. Here he is, Bob Stiller. Now, when I tell you what he did before he ran Green Mountain, you won't be so surprised that he brought meditation to the job. See, before he was the CEO of Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, he founded a little company called Easy Wider Rolling Papers. So like, fine, all right, so he meditates. But he brought meditation to his C-suite employees because he knew it made him a better employer. He thought maybe it'll help those who I work very closely with be a little more resilient too. Everyone enjoyed it. After a year or so, he had a critical insight. He said, if this is working so well for us, why not bring it to the rest of my organization? Of course, Green Mountain Coffee 
has thousands of employees who roast coffee beans, pack boxes, drive trucks. It worked well for the white collar workers. What about for the blue collar workers as well? Don't they deserve mindfulness too? Well, of course they do. And so they developed a mindful stretching program, deployed it to Green Mountain's thousands of workers around the country. At first, they were a little apprehensive. Like, these are, you know, some tough characters. Why do we want to be meditating and doing yoga in the first thing in the morning? Then they found out, oh my gosh, it feels good. We're looser throughout the day. And after the first full year that Green Mountain rolled this program out, workplace injuries at the factories went down precipitously. That's stress. Stress, we know, of course, is correlated with health. If we're super stressed, our immune systems suffer. And a company in Madison, Wisconsin, discovered this firsthand. Promega, medical device maker, they had some progressive leaders in the health and wellness team, and they said, we realize this correlation. We know that if our employees can be less stressed, perhaps they'll be healthier as well. Let's find out. We are a medical company after all. So they rolled out an eight to 10 week mindfulness intervention, and they measured both the employees who were learning how to meditate and also employees who weren't. And they measured their immune systems. They gave them small doses of the flu, in fact, to judge their immunoresponses. And sure enough, the folks that were meditating had much stronger immune reactions. They were able to fight off the flu antibodies more robustly. Another reason, focus. Oh, they're the folks at Promega. Focus. If you think about what we just did in that brief exercise, bringing our attention back to the present moment over and over and over, what is that if not a training of the mind? So often we're lost in distracted thought. We take for granted our ability to focus, to be right here, right now. And yet it is a skill that we have to learn, perhaps relearn, but it is something we have to work on. That's why in the locker rooms of teams like the Seattle Seahawks, the Boston Red Sox as well, and even the Golden State Warriors, they're talking about mindfulness. They're talking about being in the present moment, not getting hung up on a missed shot, not getting ahead of yourself and wondering what it might be like at the end of the game, but just staying in the moment. And that's why surgeons, are practicing mindfulness and meditation, allowing them to stay on task without getting distracted during a lengthy operation. And it's why backcountry firefighters, the teams that go behind the fire lines, are practicing mindfulness and meditation, trying to stay together, stay with one another in the present moment in hopes of not making a critical error. And so something's happening in our brains when we meditate. We know this, but what is it? Over the last several decades, a whole new field of science has emerged, contemplative neuroscience, where we're actually looking at what's going on in our brains when we practice mindfulness and meditation. And we can start to see the results. In an area called the amygdala, center of our stress response, shoots out hormones when we get stressed, it's actually less reactive in the minds of meditators. And the prefrontal cortex, evolutionarily the newest part of our brain, responsible for our higher order thinking, our capacity for reason and self-control, there's actually more gray matter in the minds of meditators. There's more going on in there when we meditate. Over the course of my research, I got my own brain scanned here at Yale University, and this is what they found. <laughs> it doesn't matter how long you meditate, the chatter never really ends. It's, it's not all lotus flowers out there. I saw some dubious offerings on my travels. At some companies, they're just playing Native American flute music to a room full of employees and calling it a day. Now, I love Native American flute music as much as the next guy, but it's not mindfulness. And mindfulness, of course, is being used to sell everything you can imagine these days. There's mindful mints, there's mindful meat, there's even mindful mayonnaise. <laughs> and yet, I am convinced that by and large, the companies that are bringing mindfulness and meditation into the office are doing so with really sincere intentions. And I always think back to what I saw at Aetna, big health insurer down at Hartford, Connecticut. 
The CEO is a guy named Mark Bertolini. He's a serious, hard-charging corporate type, but about five, six, seven years ago, he had a really tragic skiing accident, almost died. Nerves in his arm were separated from his spinal cord. They administered last rites at the hospital. They thought he was going to die. Several operations later, he emerged. He was intact, but in a lot of pain. For a year, he tried conventional therapies, Oxycontin, Vicodin, fentanyl, doping himself up, and he was in a cloud. He couldn't get back to work. He said enough, and he started pursuing alternative therapies. He tried cranial sacral therapy. It helped some. He tried yoga. That helped a bit more. And then he began practicing mindfulness and meditation. And the pain didn't go away. Mindfulness is no panacea. But he was able to manage his suffering more effectively. He was able to not let his physical suffering define him. And he got back to work. He took over at uh, right around the time of the financial crisis, and you would expect a corporate leader then to trim the sales, to just charge, try to keep results in line. Instead, he said, wait a sec, we're a healthcare company. I just had a powerful health experience. Let's see what happens when we bring mindfulness and meditation to our own employees. He went to his chief medical officer, a guy named Lonnie Reisman, serious medical type, and he said, Lonnie, I want to do mindfulness and meditation to our employees. And Lonnie said, ha, 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 no way. Mark appealed to the clinician in him. He said, let's measure it. Let's measure heart rate variability. Let's measure cortisol levels, common indicators of stress in the human body. And let's see what happens, eight to 10 weeks. Lonnie said, fine, you have your study. They worked with Duke University. And after the intervention was over, no surprise, the employees loved it. They're like, it was great to take an hour out of my day and not have my boss breathing down my neck. But the results spoke volumes as well. Heart rate variability was down. Cortisol levels were down. These people were actually physically less stressed. And we know that stress is terrible for productivity. We know it's terrible for health. So perhaps Aetna was going to see some benefit. Fast forward a year. They've rolled out the program because employees seem to like it. And Mark Bertolini is going over the financials of Aetna with his chief financial officer at the end of the year. Thousands of people across the country were doing it now. And what did they notice? Healthcare costs on a per employee basis had come down 9%. That's $7 million. And the only thing meaningful that they had done differently that year was offer mindfulness and yoga and meditation training to a large chunk of their employees. So I asked Mark, you know, is, is that it? Is it that simple? Can we just offer mindfulness and we'll save money? He said, it, it's too early to draw that distinction. But if I believe my employees were less stressed, healthier, more productive, then absolutely. Aetna is getting real benefit, perhaps even financial benefit. Mark had one more trick up his sleeve. He devoted these programs to his employees. And then he also realized, not dissimilar to what Bob Stiller at Green Mountain realized, that he had thousands of very low-paid workers as well. He spent the Christmas vacation one year reading this treatise, like I know you all did, Capital in the 21st Century, by French economist Thomas Piketty. And he was so moved by the arguments of inequality he read that he returned from the holidays and gave all of his lowest paid workers a 30% raise. And I said, Mark, why did you do that? And he said, as a meditator, as someone who is practicing mindfulness, becoming more aware of the effects I have on others and what power I have as a CEO, it was the obvious choice. It was something he had to do. Now, since I began looking into Aetna and all these other companies, so many more have joined this mindfulness movement. Intel, Adobe, and more are bringing mindfulness and meditation onto the job. Time Magazine and 60 Minutes have devoted segments about it, trying to understand what is going on. And I wrote a book about it, Mindful Work, How Meditation is Changing Business from the Inside Out. These stories and more are in there, and I keep hearing new ones. I'm sure there are stories even right here in this room. And so if you are interested, if you're interested in coming back to the present moment, being right here, right now, trying not to get lost in distracted thought, becoming less stressed, perhaps a bit healthier, perhaps more focused, then I invite you, too, to see what mindfulness 
in your own life and your own work might look like. Thank you very much.